you're here and we are kicking off a new series called God's Plan. Over the last seven to eight weeks, we've really talked about some difficult stuff. Um, we talked about the armor of God and how we have an enemy, and his name is Satan, the devil. He is real. And uh, we talked about how his plan for us is really to alienate us, to destroy us. He wants what is worse for us. And one of the ways he does that is by tricking us into thinking he doesn't exist. And so he is at war with us, he is attacking us, and we looked at how the armor of God equips us to be able to fight back, not just withstand his attacks, but really go on the offensive against his attacks. And we dealt with some really difficult, dark stuff. And then the following week, um, the following sermon series, we talked about the most exciting thing everybody wants to talk about when they come to church, and that is death. And we talked about death for like four weeks. And we looked at how death really is um, our second greatest enemy. But death is unnatural. No one dies from natural causes um, because death is unnatural to us. It's not what we were created for. But death really can bring some perspective to our relationship with God, the choices that we make. And ultimately, we have victory in Jesus because he resurrected from the dead. And if we follow Jesus, if we are in a relationship with him, we too can have the final say on our death and we will get to live again in the new heavens and the new earth. But I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the difficult things in life like death, um, like suffering, really caused me to ask this question, what is God's plan for me and for my life? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Have you ever wondered what does God have in store for you? What is his purpose? What is his plan? What does he want from me? Well, over the next couple weeks, I want to take a look at a guy in the Old Testament named Joseph. And I'd like to look at some of the things that Joseph went through, some of the questions Joseph had to answer or allowed himself not to answer for many, many years. But yet the resolve of Joseph and what he went through really proves a very important point. God is at work. He has a plan and he wants us to trust him. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 37. That's where we're going to be. And you know, a lot of people, they don't like the Old Testament because it's got the word old in it, and we don't like stuff, right? That's old. But really, the Old Testament is not only the authority um, for the Jews and their way of life, but it is the Word of God. It is inspired by God. It's something that he wanted us to have. And, you know, when Paul, he would actually use some of the Old Testament stories to relay some New Testament truth. And so he would look back and he would quote Old Testament scripture to teach us. And so when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, he says, these things happened to them in the Old Testament as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. When he writes that, I take that and I apply that to myself. And so when we look at the story of Joseph, I hope that we can take his example and his life and the things that he learned, and I hope that we can apply that to ourselves when we look and think about the providence and the plan of God and what he has in store for our life. Now, the first thing I want to point out before we get started is that Joseph was stuck. He was stuck with an unholy family. I don't know if you have ever felt stuck in your relationship with God, if you've ever felt stuck in your family, like, God, why did you put this family here and I'm in it? (laughs) Have you ever had that kind of question? Hopefully you haven't had that kind of question into your mind because your family has been incredible and awesome. But here's the truth, right? Everybody's family has a wart in the family, right? Everybody's got that weirdo in the family, that person that's the problem. And if you don't think that you do, I've got bad news for you. It's probably you. (laughs) It's probably you. Well, Joseph, I mean, he's got a mess of a family. When we look a little bit earlier into the uh, book of Genesis, we find that Joseph has a lot of brothers. And these brothers had murdered everyone in a city because somebody raped their sister. And so they went through and they killed them all. They took their wealth. They took their livestock. Um, They took their women. I mean, they took everything, and they killed all the men. And so these guys are are rough guys. They're rough around the edges, I guess you could say. There was another brother that he had, Judah. Now, Judah did not care for his son's widow, and she tricked him into sleeping uh, with her. And so you've got incest in their family, a complete, utter mess. He thought she was a prostitute, so he doesn't escape this either, okay? He should not have been fornicating and sleeping with a prostitute. Meanwhile, she tricked him into sleeping with her, and you want to talk about a mess. 
I mean, we are talking about an absolute chaotic mess. And then Judah had a couple sons who were so evil in the sight of the Lord that God actually put them to death. So if you have a messy family, I get a little bit of encouragement, right? When I think about my family, um, I'm from Ohio and my family is really, really messy, but it's not this messy. And so there's, there's some encouragement there. Maybe things will work out for the best. But more importantly, I want to be like Joseph. And so if you'll read along with me in the first two verses, uh, I've got the scriptures up on the screen for you in case you don't have your Bible, but here's what it says. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. So Joseph's father is Jacob. Jacob's father is Isaac. Both have received the promise that God will bless the earth through their descendants. And he gives that promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And so here we have Jacob living in the land of Canaan, and here's what it says. This is the history of Jacob. This is the generations of Jacob, maybe some of your translations have. In fact, some scholars believe that this was actually given through um, oral information passed down from generation to generation by Jacob himself about his family and about his history. And so we have this history coming to us, and here's what it says. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flocks with his brothers. And look at this. And the lad was with the sons of his in-laws, or not his in-laws, but his his stepmothers. So he's got three stepmoms. Now think about that for a second. Can you imagine having three stepmoms with a bunch of half-brothers and one full brother? I actually had a couple uh, step-dads myself. You know, my mom, she married and and got divorced and remarried again. And I've had some stepbrothers in between that. And look, step-families Blended families can be really chaotic, can they not? For those of you who come from blended families, I can remember some really messed up stuff going on. One of my stepbrothers brought drugs into the home that my mom found. You want to talk about a nightmare that we went through. That was crazy. And then, uh, you know, whenever you marry into somebody's family, you always bring their garbage with them. And so one of my stepfathers, um, he was just very, he was Italian, okay? So not that Italians are bad, it's just that he had a lot, right? He had a lot of charisma about him, to put it nicely. And so whenever he would get angry, I mean, there were veins would pop out of his neck and his eyes would get bloodshot red and he would just be very overly aggressive. Um, And so, you know, there were a couple times when uh, we actually left the house because we were afraid. I mean, it was really, really bad. I can remember one specific time, my, uh, we do have some Italians in the church, by the way, okay? So you all know I've got love for our Italians. But Regardless, uh, there was one time he actually got into it with my father, and we were crying, and we were upset, and they almost came to a fist fight, and it was over just a mess of a situation. My mom got electrocuted because, I mean, it was just horrible, okay? Yeah, so things can get really, really bad. And so here he is. His brothers are murderers. There's incest going on. He's got three stepmoms with half-brothers, and it is just a chaotic mess. He's 17 years old. And he is daddy's favorite. Now, you want to talk about making family even worse. When you've got daddy's favorite in the family, that only breeds contempt. And we're going to find out why. And so look at this at the end of verse 2. It says, but Joseph, notice what Joseph does, his daddy's favorite, reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Oh, so we've got a tattletale going on, right? Well, that's just simply not true. Really, If you actually read verse 2 strictly as it is, it may actually mean that Joseph, being 17 years old, was actually placed as the shepherd over his brothers. So one way or another, Joseph is daddy's favorite. He's getting special treatment, and he may even have been given the authority as the right-hand man of Jacob because he is the chosen one. He is the favored one. So here, we, like I said, we absolutely have a mess. Now here's the deal. Joseph noticed something that his brothers were doing, and he decides to go and report that sin or that shame to his father. Now how many of you have been stuck in a similar situation like that? Maybe it's been within your own family. I remember doing something like this when I was a young kid. But maybe it's at work. Maybe it's among your friends. And you notice something is absolutely wrong. And you've got this question you have to ask yourself, should I point it out or not? Well, what happens if you call someone out at work? What happens if you point something out in the church? Somebody's doing something wrong, maybe they've sinned against you or they're doing something immoral. And so you're stuck between, do I do the right thing no matter what the cost is 
and speak about this evil, or do I just keep my head down, my mouth shut, because I don't want to cause any trouble for myself? I know everybody in this room has been placed in a situation similar to that. Well, Joseph decides to tell his father what his brothers are doing, more likely than not, because what the brothers were doing would bring shame to Jacob, would bring shame to the family. And so he decides to stand up and point it out. Now, we find similar teachings like this in the Bible. For instance, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gives a system of what should happen when somebody sins against you and the church. It says you are to go to that person, you are to point out their fault, just you and him. It's not saying you should blast it on Facebook. Joseph didn't get on Facebook and saying, you will not believe everybody in the world what my brothers are doing out in the field to bring shame upon my family. It doesn't say he sent a group text message to everybody. It says that he went to his father and he did the right thing. Now for us as Christians, when somebody has sinned against us or we have a problem, the Bible says, look, go to them one-on-one and point out their fault. But what happens if they don't listen? It says, take two or three witnesses with you. What happens if they don't listen then? Well, it says, ultimately, bring it before the church. And that's kind of like the last line of defense. And sometimes people want it to get there like within three days, and things don't work like that. It is a long, laborious process in which you're trying to get the person to see the error of their ways and change. You know, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture when it comes to dealing with being wronged in the church. Just like Joseph felt wronged on behalf of his father, here's what it says. Brother, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore them in the spirit of anger and hostility. And, well, that's not what it says. It says in the spirit of gentleness. What's the end goal here when you're dealing with problems in your family or at work or in the church? It's to get everybody on the same page. It's to do the right thing. You're not seeking the destruction of your neighbor. You're not seeking the destruction of your coworker or your family member. You're seeking the restoration. And so it says you are to spiritually restore them with gentleness, but keep watch on yourself lest you too may be tempted. And here's what's incredible. Is there any person in this room that is without sin? So when you need to be spoken to about your sin or your shortcoming or your problem, how would you want someone to approach you? This really all works in the overall plan of God because when we ask these questions, God, what do you want for my life? Well, I think one of the most important things that God wants for your life is to stand up against sin, but to stand up for people in the spirit of gentleness. Why? What's the end goal? What's God's plan? What's for us to be on his side? not against him. And so here is Joseph pointing out the sins of his brothers and the spirit of gentleness doing the right thing, but then we've got more to the story. Here's what it says in verse 3. But Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe, But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them, and they couldn't even say a kind word about him. So if matters couldn't be worse, not as only is he daddy's favorite, but then he gets this coat of many colors that many of you who are familiar with the story know. It would have been from his shoulders down to his feet. Now in ancient uh, times and antiquity, ancient Near East culture is, is what it's called among scholars, you would really only have a robe that would be one solid color, and it wouldn't be vibrant, and it wouldn't be bright, just like Joseph got, because it was a very uh, laborious process. It was very expensive, but he doesn't, just doesn't have a bright colored coat. It's a coat of many colors. So we're probably talking about one of the most expensive, elaborate gifts that you could ever give someone um, today. It would be like getting a brand new car or a brand new house. I mean, we are talking about top of the line. Man, how how far have we come in society? He got a robe, and we're asking for cars and houses, right? I like bathrobes, by the way. That's what I asked Santa Claus for Christmas last year. What do you want for Christmas? And I wrote to him, I want a bathrobe. And guess what? He brought it to me. Isn't that cool? I wear it around the house. It's comfortable. It's great. And I already told you, I can't wait for my kids to go to school. I'm keeping that bathrobe. It'll be 15 years old, but I've got some boots, a bomber hat, and a bathrobe. And that's what I'm taking them to school in. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. Pray for my children. Pray for my children. Yeah, thank you. So he's got this, it's really, it's a tunic. It's down to his feet. It's expensive. It meant that you were privileged. You had the status. 
But it might go along with this idea that we've already discovered about Joseph. He's not only daddy's favorite, but this coat may have symbolized, I am giving you authority. I am putting you in charge. You are number one, and his brothers couldn't stand it. They could not stand it. Now, whether or not you think Joseph is an arrogant little teenager, or Joseph is actually just doing the right thing, I think really we're going to come to the conclusion of the story that God is at work in Joseph's life despite his difficult circumstances and his trials. And so just to recap, three stepmoms, ten half-brothers, one full brother, sister. He's the youngest, but the most loved. He's innocent, really, of being hated at this point. I mean, after all, he's telling his father what his brothers are doing because they're bringing shame upon the family. And yet he is absolutely hated because his brothers are full of hate and probably because of their own sin. Have you ever been hated without a reason? I just don't like the way that they look. I don't like the fact that they go to church. They're a Christian. They don't even know you, and yet they hate you. And they've never sat down to talk with you, ever. Well, here's Joseph, and he knows exactly what you're going through. How does he respond? What does he do? Well, we'll notice through the story of Joseph, he never takes his eyes off God. Despite what happens to him and what he goes through, he always tries to do the right thing, and he never stops trusting in the Lord. And he's going to face some really messy stuff, as we'll see. You know, when I ask this question, why do people hate other people without a reason? I think it's part of the sinful, corrupt nature that we've inherited from our culture. I mean, the Bible says in Titus 3.3, it says, at one time we too were foolish and disobedient and deceived and enslaved with all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Here Paul writes to Titus and he admits it. Look, there was a time in my life when I was living in such a corrupt, evil state that I not only hated other people, but other people hated me because of my passions and because I was envious and jealous. And that's exactly what's going on here. There are going to be moments in your life when you are hated without a cause. People don't like you. They'll say terrible things about you because at the core of their hatred is their own envy and their own hatred for themselves. That's exactly what's going on in the story of Joseph. Now, as I said before, Joseph is stuck in an unfair situation with an unholy family. Look, his older brother Reuben he was, very, um, he was very rejected and despised by Israel, the firstborn of Jacob. And here's why. He defiled his father's marriage bed. He actually committed sexual sin in the family, incest, as the firstborn. I mean, can you imagine things like this going on in your family? I mean, this is horrific. And so it may have been Reuben being the firstborn, committing sexual sin, bringing shame to his father. He was actually removed as the chosen one. And Joseph, the favorite, was placed in charge. Now here's a question that I want to ask you. How should Joseph's brothers have reacted when they were confronted with their sin, when they were basically called out? What should have been their reaction? Well, probably humility and confession and repentance. They probably should have changed their attitude and their mindset, but instead they hardened their heart and they filled it with hatred. And here's the deceitfulness of sin. When sin is pointed out, it's often our nature to be angry and to reject it, and to not listen when the other person is trying to speak to us. What is God's plan for your life? Well, it's not just to stand up against sin and stand for people, but it's to recognize our own sin and our own heart and our own ways and be humble and gentle and open when people will approach us and they come to us and they're pointing things out in us that they see from the outside looking in. God is at work. He has a plan. His brothers should have responded one way, but instead they hardened their hearts to the point where they couldn't even say a kind word about uh, about Joseph. And here's what I've noticed. If you can't at least say one kind thing about another person, your heart is probably hardened. We can all find something good in another person, even if we disagree with them almost radically, unless they're really a heinous, horrible person, right? And we know people like that shooters who shoot up malls and Walmart stores and people who sexually abuse children. I mean, these are people that are in such deep, corrupt states that it's hard to find something good about another person. But most of us in general, right, when we talk with other people, we should be able to recognize not just the bad, but also the good. And so here is Joseph. His oldest brother, number one, has been sexually immoral. 
His other brothers have murdered an entire village full of men and stolen their wealth and their money and their livestock and everything else in the name of their sister who was raped. And then we've got his other brothers committing sexual sin, failing, just a complete, utter, chaotic mess. And then something happens to Joseph. He gets a couple dreams. Let's read that together in verse 5. It says, one night Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Sometimes dreams feel so real, don't they? You wake up and you actually think that they've happened. Well, this was actually going to happen. And his brothers saw the writing on the wall. The thing that they feared the most was this little rug rat reigning over them. The 17-year-old boy. But that's exactly what's going to happen. And they hated him even more. Have you ever find yourself figuring out the plan of God and being like, I don't really like that plan? You mean God wants me to be sexually pure? That's kind of inconvenient. I got to test it out before I want to buy it, right? Sat down with a young man not too long ago. Those were the exact same words that came out of his mouth. I said, that is the worst picture of relationship that you could ever imagine. For females or males, there's no security. There's no faithfulness. You mean to tell me if it doesn't work out sexually, you're not going to be committed to the relationship? That's a terrible mentality and idea when it comes to a relationship. But that plagues our culture. Does it work for me? Does it satisfy me? Is what I want. And there are times when I read the plan of God and I'm like, man, that's pretty difficult. That's pretty tough. What is the outcome? Is it love of God or is it hatred of his plan? Well, look at what happens. Listen to this dream. So he is totally, (laughs) have you ever met somebody that's completely oblivious to reality around them? Well, sometimes I, get, I, I kind of think, well, maybe that's Joseph in the situation that he's going through, right? You mean to tell me, dude, you don't even pick up on the fact that your brothers can't stand you, and now you want to tell them about a dream that's going to make them hate you even more? So here's Joseph saying, hey, let me tell you something. I've got some more news. And so he says, hey, listen to this. We were out in a field trying to bundle up the grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around you, bowed down low before mine. And his brothers responded, so you think you'll be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. So it's not just the content of the dreams, it's how he even talked about the dreams. As if he came across as arrogant. Who do you think you are, 17-year-old teenager? And it says in verse 9, soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream. He's not getting the picture. Oblivious or arrogant, you choose. And it says, this time he told the dream to his father. We'll back up a little bit. Listen, I had another dream. The sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down before mine. And this time he told the dream to his father as well, to his brothers. And his father scolded him. So Jacob's like, all right, look, you're my favorite. That's clear. But this is, this is taking it too far. <laughs> Even Jacob's like, look, Joseph, I don't know who you think you are, but I'm the one in charge. If you're going to be number one, it's going to be because I say so. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? So here's something in ancient society. The father, the patriarch, was number one. And then he would transfer that blessing onto somebody of his choosing. Nine times out of ten, it would be the firstborn. Or it would be somebody who would be divinely chosen through the inspiration and the prophetic utterance of God. God would encourage somebody like Abraham or encourage somebody like Isaac or Jacob to to choose who would be the chosen one. And so here even Jacob is saying, look, you might be taking this a little too far. I'm the patriarch. You're the son. Are you really telling me that your mother and I Number one in this family, you're actually going to bow down to you? And look what it says. But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. You see, Jacob has a little bit of life experience that a lot of those in the youth don't have. You see, Jacob knows that at various times, God is at work. He has a plan. In fact, Jacob probably started thinking about his experience with his brother Esau. Esau was the chosen one of the family. He was the first one. He should have received the birthright. He should have received the inheritance. He should have been the promised one. But Esau gave it all up for a bowl of soup. And Jacob probably started thinking back on his own relationship with God 
in his own history. And he starts thinking about this, and here's what he's thinking. What's God's plan? Is God at work? Is there something more going on here? Look, when we're attacked by our enemy, the devil, when we experience death and suffering and tribulation, we should step back and ask the question, what's God's plan? Where is he going with this? Why is this happening? We should run away from making assumptions about how God feels about us or what his plan is, and we should ask, what is God's plan? You know, I couldn't help but make this analogy with Joseph that Jesus himself, when he stood up for what was right, as the chosen one of God, the son of God, he too was hated without a cause. It says in John chapter 15, Jesus says, if I had not done among the works of them that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen and they have hated both me and my father, but this is to fulfill what was written in their law. They hated me without a reason. Even hatred of Jesus himself without a cause God was at work. Look, I don't know the status of your relationships or your family. I don't know what's going on in your heart and your mind in this church. What is God doing with you? I don't know. But despite your circumstances, being in an unholy family like Joseph, being hated without a cause like Jesus, God is at work. He has a plan. Figure out what that plan is and trust him. And so Jesus reminded his disciples, look, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. And this is why the world hates you. And so here's the concluding thought. It's simply this. When you are stuck, the only thing to get you through this mess is to have a trusting relationship with God. God has a plan. He is at work. And so despite your worldly relationships, God is still going to use you. Despite your unfair situation, God can still work through you. And despite the hatred you receive for following Christ, God is still with you. He has a plan, and he is at work. Let's stand.